Ah, Varangia, the crown jewel of cities. Nestled in the crater of a fallen meteor, this city of wonders has existed for hundreds of years, withstood countless attempts of invasion, and has absorbed a myriad of cultures into its ever-expanding folds. Truly, it is a city where everything is possible, if you have the right connections, of course. Money and power oftentimes go hand in hand in this world of bankers, thieves and mercenaries, and one should not underestimate the lengths some will go to achieve either. Ancient noble families battle for dominion, both on the fields of war and in the halls of trade and stock exchange, while scholars hire assassins to rid themselves of pesky rival researchers. Bands of sellswords swear themselves to those who pay them what they want, while guilds of like-minded fanatics strive to steer the development of this chaotic mixing pot in the direction they wish for it to take. Varangia is a city of resilience, its people strong and independent, bending the knee for neither king nor god but profit itself. No matter where you go, no matter who you ask, any citizen of this coastal settlement will tell you that there is no better place to be. And they may be right, because if you cannot find what you desire for on the road of thousand pleasures or in the arena cities, then you will never find it. Perhaps it is something dark and forbidden you seek, something banned by your dogmatic faith or cowardly regent. Well, I'm sure there are plenty of less scrupulous individuals who can cater to those needs in the demonic city. As long as you know how to get past the quarantine, of course. And while you're there, perhaps you will venture through the gate at its very center, seeking artifacts and experiences unlike anything you could have ever dreamed of in our mortal realms. Will you join the elven high lords in their political games, or will you take part in the uprising against them? Will you side with the witch burners, or will you nurture your twisted talents in the dark where no prying eyes can see? In Varangia, decisions like this will face you every day, and you best be prepared for it. Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sweet Rolls. I'm Chris. I'm Toby. And I'm Martin. And today we will be talking about... We'll be talking about my uh, world creation, uh, my own game setting, and it's called Varangia. Hmm. And if you've been listening to this podcast before, you've heard mention of it probably more times than you care for, especially since you also probably don't know that much about it. But we're here to change that. So, sure. uh, Martin, I uh, put you on the spot today. I told you today that this is what you were supposed to talk about, I think. Yeah. And you've made quite a good job. I can see you've made like a million little notes on the on the paper I gave you. So uh. yeah, because this is actually the first time that someone actually wants to know a lot about it, yeah. except yeah. the ones that are playing with it. Yeah. Okay, uh, you have thirty minutes. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Toby's okay. never played it, so <laughs> no, I've never I've never been in uh, Martin's group. Well, I. I'll just start, and I'll start yeah. rambling, and you'll just have to give Absolutely. me pointers or something. Absolutely. Well, it all kind of started with, uh, in some um, earlier episodes, I, I mentioned that the, the first role-playing game that I ever played was uh, uh, Dracula Domori Cronopia, mm-hmm. which yep. was a, uh, not a very popular uh, follow-up to a very popular Swedish yeah. uh, role-playing yeah. game. Dracula is like Dungeons and Dragons, but a bit more silly, right? Yeah. yeah. No. no not, well, well, they had diff- ducks. Yeah. But well, still. Wasn't that second edition, though? Uh, I think. Um, but Cronopia was a little bit inspired, I think, about for, from the setting of Planescape, with one big city. Yeah, I'm not sure where they where they got the inspiration from, but it, but it might have been Planescape. Yeah, it was a yeah. huge city, Cronopia, basically. Yeah, it, it was basically it was like taking a fantasy type of like a fantasy version of like New York City, mm. uh, like yeah. a huge city, a melting uh, pot, a yeah. melting pot, and just pouring in all of the fantasy main fantasy races and, and uh, classes classes and, yeah. and everything and just try to make a believable way for them to be together yeah like a huge city sprawl of everything yeah yeah and i this was my first role-playing game and i loved it i loved the tone of it i loved the 
the fantastic, cynical way of life that you had in Chronopia and everything about it. As it was my first game, I always, I always kept a very nostalgic kind of love for it, uh, even if I objectively can say that it, it did have a lot of problem, mm-hmm. uh, problems. And um, also, as the years went on by, went by the, the following... Um, oh, the splat books, the, the extra yeah, books. Yeah, the yeah. extra books and everything and added on. It, it, they were never really good. No, it kind of... Because uh... they always, it, they became even more superlative mm. every book so yeah. they kind of made the base really not redundant anymore uh-huh, so right. yeah um so this game it really had a lot of problems mm. but i loved it so when i started game mastering more I, I obviously i wanted to tell some stories in this world so i tried it out and i failed uh, time and time and time again um yeah, I remember we played once at my dad's place. Yeah, Columbia, very and briefly. I, uh, yeah, and it worked kind of okay. No. Uh, but we had some problems, um, and I think they were they were from two two sources, two separate sources. Yeah. One of them was the inherent problems in the game. Uh, it was kind of unbalanced, and uh, the setting they had like a like a god emperor or something, mm. which was a really strange uh, faction that yeah. you couldn't really understand. Who'd enjoy a game with a god emperor? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, yeah. but this, uh, like an even more enigmatic god emperor. Oh, okay, okay. Like some, uh, some shadow king. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and uh, who made no sense. Mm-hmm. It was really strange and kind of used like a deus ex machina mm-hmm. uh, all the like, time. Like the patrician in, in the Ankh Morpork in no, this the, world, the, or the, even the, more powerful? Yeah, even more powerful, oh, but okay. even less understandable. Uh-huh. So so it's not really a good faction. Okay. It, it had the inherent problems. But then we had the, uh, in my opinion, even greater issue of all the players, because mm-hmm. a lot of them had heard about this game or played it when they were really young and played it very like a kobold type playing game. So they had, they brought with the memories of this game that weren't at all the playing style mm-hmm. that I wanted to, to use in the setting. Mm-hmm. So, for example, a lot of players who like uh, uh, Mutant, a Swedish oh, yeah, playing yeah, yeah. game. Um, Post-apocalyptic yeah. apocalyptic game. Um, with the, yeah. For example, in one of the versions, they have mutated animals, which, yeah. sp- which if done in one way is really cool. Yeah. But if done in another way, is just really silly. Yeah, and it, you, it, and it, it was made in the eighties, right? So it was kind of riding the, the teenage mutant ninja turtles wave mm, a little mm. bit, uh, which made it more uh, less serious. I mean, yeah. So so that's also an issue playing yeah. mutant if you want to yeah. do it today. Uh, so anyway, I I just I just realized if I want to play Chronopia, I'll just have to dress it up in a costume. So people won't immediately recognize it as Chronopia. So, so the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was fooling the world. It didn't ex- Chronopia didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so yeah. initially, I, I just st- I started by changing the name. Yeah. And after I started to change the name, I, I just made a list of everything that I found problematic. And after that, I made a new list of things I found really illogical. And after that, I made a list of things that were just plain silly. So that was kind of the deconstructing phase. And then I made a construction phase with just taking from a lot of inspirations uh, that I really liked. Like in one really important one was, was the computer game Thief. Mm-hmm. If you ever no, played yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I played it. Uh, yeah. Thief, the Metal Age. No, first one was Dark Project, and mm-hmm. then it was the Metal Age. So really the city, the setting in Thief, it made a great impression on me. It's kind of like a stealth game, right? Like a first-person stealth yeah, game. Yeah, they call it Sneak 'em Up when oh. it came. Yeah, uh, interesting game. That is idea. not a great name. No, 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 it's no. not. But uh, it was a it was launched as that. I, uh, well, yeah. When was it released? <laughs> By the way, ninety the first one, ninety eight. Well, it, it was a quite a few years now, oh. uh, so I, I'm not really sure. Yeah. But it's because, because it was very different from the other major sneaking title at the time, which was like Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. Uh, they were very, very different yes. in the way they and approached it. I didn't really like Metal Gear Solid, mm. but I loved Thief. Mm. So, yeah. And especially the setting and mm. the voice actors and everything. that mm. the, the game mechanics were perhaps, well, they were okay. Yeah, but the story uh, was really strong. Yeah. So I took elements and then I kind of launched into just remaking this and I named it Varangia mm. after just going through a series of, of really bad names. 
<laughs> and, and, it, and it's funny, just, I think I mentioned it to you before, the Varangia is actually the name of a faction in Dark Souls 2. I didn't so, know so that. So I found there's like Vikings? Yeah, because c- in English it's actually the Varangian Guard. They were the bodyguards mm-hmm. to the Byzantine Emperor. And uh-huh, they, they okay. were so... Because mm-hmm. you find Varangian armor and I was like, what the fuck? When I, <laughs> when I found it, I was like, how? And then I did some research and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. my friend published a book. <laughs> yeah, like, my, they, they stole my friend's work and it doesn't even look like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's actually... I was actually reading a book about uh, Väringarna, as they're called oh, yeah, in, in yeah. Swedish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, there was a translation there into Varangian. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, I could use yeah. this name. Yeah. It was very vague and, and no one had heard. I had never mm-hmm. heard of it. Yeah. So it, it, it worked for my purposes. Yeah. yeah. So basically, Varangia, it's like a, it's a huge city. Mm-hmm. And people then ask, how many people live there? Yeah. And I say, a lot. Because I think that's one of the basics is that nothing is really specified. Because no. yeah. you don't have a census. You don't have a modern day computers. You don't have anything like that. So, so people don't actually know how yeah. many people mm. live in there. No, no. But huge amounts, like safely assumed millions. Yeah. Mm. Which, considering the time of the setting, is, is a so super huge. It would be impossible to have a census of that. Improbable. Improbable. But you had cities uh, that lived more than a million people mm. in Rome in mm. ancient times. Mm. So so it's uh, improbable, but not impossible. Mm. Of course, the exact setting is, uh, setting is, of course, impossible. So, mm. But anyhow, the setting is a medieval setting, medieval fantasy setting. But the city itself, it, it differs from the rest of the world in being more of a, I would call it like Italian-style Renaissance city. Mm. Uh, so they have a, in our historic timeline, a more advanced culture, technology, and mm. um, political system. Mm. Right away, a book series that springs to mind when you talk about Venice, medieval-inspired cities, uh, I've been thinking about Lies of Loch Lamora, the Loch Lamora books. And um, that came out after you started, Brian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got to say, Lies of Loch Lamora and the rest of the books, they, they've been a huge influence on Varangia. Yeah. They weren't a part of the initial influence. No, but you but can definitely see the imprint. Yeah, I, the I've used, I used a lot of, very good uh, books, lot of the things the from Camaro yeah. there. So. Yeah, very good books. I can highly recommend them. Yeah, I like them a lot. Okay. Um, Have you read them? No. <laughs> then you, you can borrow my book. Uh, or or yeah. an audiobook, maybe. And the funny thing is, they actually they touch a, a bit upon the thing that I that was really my vision. What I also liked in Chronopia, I thought at least that I saw that Chronopia was a place where you could play games that really went from comedy to tragedy. Yeah. So um, so I actually I, I named this uh, I used because I, I really do like matinee movies. Yeah. I like adventure. Ad- action adventures mm. like uh, the Three Musketeers or mm. the, yeah. the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, everything like that. When people are like swinging in chandeliers, yeah. um, fencing on balustrades, very fancy. Yeah, like uh, for example, Monty Python and the Quest of the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a very way. comedic. <laughs> yeah. uh, in, but in they, way, they just. But I mean, yeah. uh, like a, a real like style, yeah, yeah, style yeah, focus, a, a flamboyant uh, style, fla- yeah, yeah. A flamboyant. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, an important part of range of flamboyanter, and I also do like film noir, like the Maltese Falcon and um, all kinds of those, like darker, yeah. uh, with a gray, really gray Gritty, cast of, of yeah. characters yeah. and everything. Always like raining, that. bad lighting from. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I do love both of those, and I thought to myself, why can't I have both of these elements in the same story? Yeah, mm. why not both? Because yeah. it's also. Uh, how a lot of my the game groups that I've run actually work. We we really do like those heavy, um, heavy periods of um, high intensity drama and everything. But after a while, we we have to have an outlet, a break, and, mm. and you would just pull in some comedy mm. and just take a break from that mm. and and just go on into the story. So I really, Varangia is all about just telling stories that either have. They could just go th- mm. through the spectrum. Spectrum, like mm. they could be really dark stories, and it yeah. could be really light stories. That, if, if I can make an aside there, mm. uh, when you let me, because I asked you if I was allowed to GM in there, and I GM'd for you guys when you had a had a bit of a break, I asked you if I could uh, game master, and you told me 
exactly what you're telling me now, that, that you always pictured Varangas having a lot of stories to be told. So I named the Facebook group uh, Berettelse from Varangas, like stories from Varanga, because I think that that's a huge untapped thing. Like you could write books about this. Yeah, because there's this Honoré de Balzac, uh, mm-hmm. a French uh, author in the uh, 19th century. Mm-hmm. He, he wrote like, oh, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's like hundreds of books mm-hmm. uh, all told about Paris and the mm. cross sections of characters uh, mm-hmm. reappearing. So, yeah. so he paints like a tapestry of Paris, yeah. of, of the, the underworld of Paris, just by really telling uh, the world of Paris from uh a hundred different viewpoints. And I just kind of like that about really taking something and bringing it to life by telling it through different yeah. views. So so that's why I kind of came up with my genre, matinee noir, yeah. as I call it. Which is a just super interesting uh, <laughs> thing to play. So what, what you're going to see when you come to Varangia? It's um, geographically, it's in a huge crater. Like I could say if you played Final Fantasy VII, I guess you could just uh, draw parallel to... Uh, the northern crater, right? Yeah, yeah, like 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 a huge me- mm, meteorite yeah. crater. Talking about continent-sized crater, almost. Yeah, like like a world extinction event uh, meteor. Yeah, or, or meteorite. Yeah. So it's a bowl shaped. Yeah, a bowl shape, like yeah, yeah a star fall. <clears throat> um, so it's so it's really like a little microcosm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to get in, and it's hard to hard to get out. You can. You can sail in through like a really broken passage where you need a reef, yeah, yeah, yeah a reef where you really need like a navigator, loops, a yeah. navigator. Oh yeah, yeah, someone to show you the way. And otherwise, you just have to fly because yeah. Varangia is set in like a. I wouldn't call it steampunk through and through because that kind of makes people go along uh, yeah. along the traditional steampunk yeah, tangent, well, and it's not really that because. Chronopia from the beginning had a steampunk element yeah. you know, run by black gas and, and magic, and it's more—it's more of that reason. Yeah. So, like uh, pre pre steampunk. Yeah, pre steampunk. It's more like Leonardo da Vinci punk. and um, da Vinci punk. Yeah, da Vinci punk, like <laughs> uh, like like cogs yeah. and uh, and gas and everything. And, and you do have flying airships, yeah. but. Not everything is made out of steel and have cocks just no. randomly spinning on them. Like there's always brass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think we get the idea like it, it's more primitive machinery. Yeah, and this is primarily th- this is just contained to Varangia, which is like a a place where people for freedom of thought travel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, you have it's a cultural center. Like yeah, a, a cultural a, a center. Scientific. Because you have essentially you have a lot of a huge fantasy world where there is huge empires and uh, lush young jungles, everything and, like yeah, that, yeah. and you have um, generally oppressive regimes and yeah. oppressive uh, uh, religions not really interesting into carrying the scientific yeah. method forward. Mm. And then you have Varangia, which, which is due to its geographically isolated. Placement, it has had a real like freedom from the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. it's also a democracy, and they kind of make themselves known in the world as everyone can ca- can come here and they can become anything. Yeah, they uh, can become citizens. Yes, yeah. <laughs> this is of course a lie. They can't become what they want. But oh, <laughs> so this it, it has an element of the yeah. American dream. Yeah, uh, you could say. So if you're in Varanga, you could really just see a lot of people coming from the outside, expecting to come into this land of milk and honey and gold, um, gold Paved in the streets, streets yeah, and everything yeah. like that. Instead, they're gonna kind of come to a, a really packed city yeah. where they're gonna rub shoulders with. Um, maybe you're coming there. You're dressed as a knight. Yeah. You come from coming from your really homogenous country, and yeah. then you, suddenly you're faced with a street filled with people from a hundred different cultures, yeah. dozens of languages, two dozens of completely different gods or uh, philosophies. And um, you can see people, um, the inborn Varangians, yeah. more, more or less using more Renaissance kind of gear and clothing, like maybe they'll just carry, carry a rapier. Mm. And one of the de- defining um, things about Varangia is it's it's really a... A vertical setting because together with airships and some kind of super super efficient um, engineering you do have a lot of huge high towers okay so not only is this city massive not like massively wide it seems it's also very tall 
Now, I, I wouldn't say that it's massively wide, actually. It's okay. just, it's more tall, and there's a lot of people it's there. It's compact. It's very compact. Well, if this... If the city contains <clears throat> millions, I would say that it would be quite large. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, it's large. It's just yeah. uh, it's. <laughs> but then, the, then the question comes: Is it taller than it is wide? Ah, uh, well, I, I think that no, probably okay. not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I okay. I thought about it for like three seconds, and of course, it's not. Of yeah. course, it's not. No, no. <laughs> but it's getting uh, there. Uh, no, but but it's it's. It's also going underground as well. Yeah, I think you could really just kind of use the 1920s Manhattan mm. as a, like a reference in your head. It's that was built out of just steel columns, and you built like hundreds and hundreds of meters high buildings. Yep. And that's kind of the the technology level in engineering that you do have in Baranja, which is, of course, a lot more forward than we have in, in different areas. No, oh, yes. But when you get to Baranja, when you visit this city, yeah. uh, and you see there's a lot of different people coming in, uh, how, what, what kind of order is there in the city? Who's keeping order on things? Well, uh, Baranja is basically... Is it lawless? Oh, well, no, it's not lawless. Even if... It has, in comparison to a lot of societies, had quite lax laws. A lot of different areas, you're, you're actually... If you say the administrators of the city, actually, they focus and care on four things, mainly. Uh, see if I get this right. Taxes. Mm -hmm. Taxes and tolls and all kind of income. Money. Money. Fire prevention. If you live in a huge, tall city, you don't want any kind of fires breaking out. So fires and anything concerning fire hazard has horrendous uh, punishments. Yeah. And more pork? Yeah, this Ooh. is very similar. Uh, like yeah. The general feel is very similar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Plague, <clears throat> kind of the same thing. Yeah. And after that, you do have what is called as public order. The spice must flow. Yeah, yeah, because the, kind of the trade, because this is a huge trade metropole. Yeah. So you want to have public order after that, they don't really care if you're, if you're murdered on a back street. Mm. Why would they? No. Um, so you're free to hire a private detective to, to clear it up, but the, the city guard won't care. No. Uh, and why should they? There's always if, more people coming. Yeah, but if you're murdered like in the middle of, a, uh, of, a, of the town square, yeah. of course they're going to act because you're upsetting the public order. And if you murder a higher up who, who has a lot of money invested in different things. Yeah, and they're, then, then insurance that, issues. Yes, yeah. and that person will probably probably have like their own private army mm. who will make sure that you won't make that mistake twice of touching mm. them. Mm. You don't really have a, uh, a class system based on blood, but you do have a class system based on money and power and influence. Mm. And who are the most influential in this? And the most influential, they're actually the... The Elvar. Elves which or El Elvar? Elvar. Elvar. Because if they're humans or not, it's actually a point that is not really clear. Mm. They themselves say that they're not human. A lot of humans say that, of no. course, they're humans. And they look different, very different. Right? Yeah, they look very different, but still kind of similar. Mm. So They have uh, spiky, <coughs> pointy ears. They have completely green eyes, if I recall. And they yes. have very extreme hair colors. Yeah, like flowers, like yeah. kind of like clear, clear red, no, like yeah, a yeah. like yeah. a so rose. It's or... like a huge contrast. Yeah, yeah. like okay. bright so, pink or, or mm -hmm. bright orange, like the kind of that really. Uh, so they really stand out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And these these are the native uh, native people of the valley, or at least they lived here. The first ones. Yeah, the yeah. first ones. They lived here a substantially longer time than anyone else, and this meteorites had left a lot of a lot of special minerals and metals and everything in the ground so the flora and fauna of this valley is different than the rest of the world not kind of like sci-fi different but mm. different mm. and the elvars they are the bound in huge clans called houses mm. and there are seven great houses and those are the at least the seven most powerful factions uh, yeah. factions yeah. in varangia and they're they're all a combination of um, army, right. bank, merchant. Uh, merchant house, academics, academics, and mob family yeah, yeah. all together, all rolled into one. Entertainment mm. too, some of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any kind of businesses. Yeah, uh, and they rule Varangia mostly through a like a Venetian bureaucracy system. Mm. You buy licenses and everything. 
Of course. Yeah, so maybe. papers are very important. Hence why fire is so so yes, more yes. so for him there, there's, there's not not really a problem being a slave trader but operating without a license Mm-mm. of course that's that's it of course it is <laughs> so yeah it's all operated on paper it's all operated on and checks and balances right well, yeah because there's um, of course a as i'm i uh, i'm a fan of um, Viking sagas mm-hmm. as Viking sagas they consists of, of three pieces it's uh, history a general genealogical history mm-hmm. of who your parents and your parents and parents yeah. parents parents were mm-hmm. and it's uh, hardcore action and it's court courtroom drama that's the mm. three main in- ingredients in ev- any uh, viking saga that's what the vikings really thought were was the most exciting so of course lawyers are a great part of orangia mm-hmm. uh, anything written on yeah. paper is important of right. course. It is. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it's a democracy, though. How does that work with the Elvar factions? Isn't that kind of contrast each other, or? Um, yeah, it's they. Actually, uh, could you just kind of repeat that? How? Yeah, can you... yeah. Like, there's a democracy in Barangia, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so who do you vote for? You vote for the people who um, actually put themselves up for for vote. And what yeah. do they do? Who are they? Uh, they're. Um, all of the invoted of so-called politicians, mm-hmm. they um, they all serve in what is actually the the Varangian state apparatus, mm-hmm. which is consisted of um, councils, mm. specific councils for specific tasks. Yeah, and all the councils are uh, color coded because the Varangian symbol is a star and the rainbow, because of the Elvar. Yeah, yeah. Do th- these colors correspond to the Elvar houses, or are they different? Uh, no, they don't correspond. Okay. At, lo- at least not officially. And they don't really have the same colors mm. even if they're mm, similarities. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's so. more like a rainbow. So yeah. Easy to, to distinguish. Yeah. So, for example, you have the Blue Council, mm. who um, has the responsibility of uh, law and order, um, the city guard, um, mm. uh, everything like that, yeah. uh, courts, uh, prisons, everything like that. You do have the Red Council who uh, does keep, uh, as its most important, is um, engineering and building, uh, mm-hmm. fire prevention, and the army. That's mm-hmm. their, yeah. uh, well, their that's combined... Well, uh, very... Uh, at least the army... Yeah, because c- the army consists of... Um, in, um, oh, like in the emergencies, they... Yeah, yeah like the, um, the Roman soldiers. They mm-hmm. are also used for public construction, mm-hmm. yeah. and they're the only kind of state-sanctioned firefighters. Yeah. yeah. So that's the the red uh-huh, court, okay, the red okay. council. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And you have I could just mention a thirty. You can just mention another one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the yellow council mm. who um, has um, sanitation. It's the most important aspect. Yeah, the of... most <laughs> important. They have. Um, I, I GM um, the yellow council <laughs> game, so I, they're very close to my heart. <laughs> Hospitals, yeah. uh, sanitation, plague control, plague control. One of their great things and. A lot of these councils also have their own military forces, of course. Mm, yeah. And the Yellow Council have two of those. Yeah. They have both the... Um, the sewer watch. Yeah, the sewer commando. Mm. Um, f- what? Es- the sewers the- are very dangerous. Yeah, they, they essentially they fight monsters in the sewers. Okay. Why there is monsters, we, could, we, should, we, we should probably not go into... I don't think we have time for that. <laughs> no. We should definitely have a second episode. No, but there's, there is, there's monsters. Yeah, there is monsters. We, we, and there's a reason for it. It's a melting plague. Yeah. And they also have the plague control commando. Who essentially just cordons off and waits for uh, sets up quarantines and waits for yeah. people to die. No, yeah. okay. And so, Varangia, it's um, it's, it's kinda... really really an urban environment. Yeah. And many of the games kind of consists of if you're coming outside, it's really kind of getting into the urban mindset and um, changing your priorities yeah. and really starting to care about things as fashion, style, status, yeah. and everything within the city. Uh, I mean, you could compare it to, say, in the in the Middle Ages, going to a city, having Turkish coffee, then going to watch a wrestling match, a Viking, Viking wrestling match, and then going to, a, I don't know, a, a, an Asian tea ceremony hmm. in the same day. This is yeah. kind of melting pot of cultures. Yeah. And the amount of campaigns that can be run in this environment is... It's infinite. Well, yeah, in, in my opinion, it yeah. is. Because you really have... There really is wilder wilderness in uh, in the great like like an impenetrable jungle actually in yeah. the crater. 
surrounding this city. And you have everything from high intrigue yeah. to we are, we are played um, criminal gangs doing like very forthright um, action on the streets. We have played political rebels mm. trying to change the political system, actually uh, also uh, succeeding. overturning, yeah, succeeding yeah. and uh, overturning the political system, changing so... Not exactly to the way we want it, no, but, no. but we, we did change it. And that's really integral part of the setting in itself, but how I treat the setting is that it's a cooperative creation process. Mm. Uh, I really try to make my players into creators themselves, yeah. and they they get to um, say how they think things should work or yeah. really invent their own things. I usually accept them, and we incorporate them. And, and I got to uh, say, as a player, it's a very intense, very high-powered creative session every time we play. It's always like, oh, what about this and this? Everyone's like contributing mm. to the general consensus, which yeah. I've never experienced in a game before. Yeah, because we, we kind of built up the... So I would say that almost everyone get, gets the theme and the feel and the internal logic yeah. of the of the setting now. So... It's, it's very like a, easy yeah. for people to just pull it's things like out of their mind. mind. We're, we're yeah. sort of, and we're bouncing ideas all the time, and we're just filling in stuff. And essential has been so. I everything that has happened in the game world, it's always going forward. Every mm. game group that does something, it affects the entire setting. Yeah, I, I know, I know the feel. It feels very powerful. Yes, to uh, have an influence on the yeah. And I actually run uh, several times. I, I ran two different game groups at the same time who were playing and it was happening simultaneously in the setting. So every time they were, they got to kind of read in the paper if, what the other group has done. Hmm. They didn't know about this themselves. So, no, no, okay. so they were, <laughs> yeah. but we have a, a, a kind of lot of just organic creation. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we're um, we're a little bit past our deadline, but I really want you to. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here and say, give me three or sorry, give us. I, I keep saying me. Uh, give yeah, us. Yeah, it's three, all about you. It's all about me. Well, I've been very quiet this session. Uh, three examples of m super memorable moments in the game, like just short descriptions of stuff when you would just went, "Holy shit, we've actually created this." And also one small question, does any of them include Chris? Doesn't have to, but... Oh, shh. Well... Or, I... or at least one, at least one. <laughs> like, not about me, I mean... One I'm... is probably... Yeah. One is, one is fine. Uh, I should have spent my preparation to think about this. But I do love the moment we had this gaming group that had been fighting as political rebels. Hmm. And they had actually started a weaponized rebellion in the streets their own point was actually burning an archive yeah um and they have seen this rebellion kind of go as a lot of rebellions go just through their hands and they're standing there they're new leaders with more extreme ideas and they have had a really tight-knit strong relationship in this group kind of fighting and you see now that when they're no longer driving the rebellion and the rebellion is just racing on you see that inside this group all the tensions that has been there it just kind of explodes and the group disintegrates itself and chris here he's playing a character who's just a real careerist just want to go up up and up and actually <laughs> does the hideous act of take a job for uh, the drug dealing Elvars, um, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> and doing this by selling out the youngest member of your group that really looked up into yeah, that up I to raised. You, that, that you raised. <laughs> what? And <laughs> paralyzed by poison and sold to cannibals. What? <laughs> to get rid of her body. <laughs> and this is not just some random cannibals. That, that these were a human-eating faction that I had a lot of dealings with. And it was just so beautiful because just to see Johanna, who, yeah. who ran the other yeah. character, just see her, <laughs> see her get so completely betrayed, but also really liking how this really fit into the group. The group just disintegrating, fitting into the theme, yeah. fitting into Varangia. And just yeah. how the rebellion just eats its own children, yeah. and um, and that that was a, a such a powerful ending. And I, there are so many things that happened that session uh, with with Daniel's character and with everyone's character, Joel's character. Like it just it was like a movie w yeah. being there. 
just yeah. watching it all unfold it was very intense and just on that on that note i i do think i have the other action actually because yeah. this this is the when i had two groups actually being in the same scene at the same time mm. even though we couldn't play mm. it at the same time mm. this was one of the ignition points for the weaponized rebellion that i was talking about this is daniel that you had here um, in a previous podcast mm-hmm. Yeah. He had a character who had been turned down at the university. He had, he had a like a a nemesis. Yeah, or his. Yeah, he he'd been slowly losing more and more ground and respect yeah, to a Elvar professor. Uh, so they had like a professional <laughs> grudge, mm-hmm. and this just turned more and more and more sour. So Daniel just he tries and he gets some other outcasts to yeah. just strike back at these. Elvar, yeah. And by outcast, Elvar. You, mean, you mean fairly mediocre students. Yeah. And what starts out as a, just a kind of an attack. Yeah. A just brutal A brutal, murder. brutal, vicious murder. Quickly, because, and they attract new followers. Yeah. Because they had done something really awful. They, they killed an Elvar woman. Yeah. In, yeah. in cold blood. Yeah, having nothing to do with this, but... And I gave his character a choice here because there, there was immediately some, a few NPCs yeah, coming there and trying to turn this into a racial thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. And Daniel's character as being quite naive as he played him, he was in a political idealist. He chose to say that his character did not really see these motives for what they were. So he actually became the front figure for what turned into a racial genocide. Completely out of his control. Oh, I I wouldn't really call it a genocide. But the defining act starting this, the war on the streets, was Daniel's character leading or Snars being pushed by his followers to attack a famous party being held every year in the uh, Alvar society, uh, the high society. Yeah. And it was like a birthday party. And he used one of the other characters because that character made wine. Yeah, it was a wine merchant, famous wine merchant. Mm. Uh, he used that character unknowingly to yeah. just plant in a lot of um, drugs or like, uh, like soft poison. Yeah, sedative. Into this, a sedative. Yeah. Yeah. And this party was also known as having a lot of children. So they called it like the, the children's party. A lot of people just kind of pooling their children's birthday parties and just having one gigantic yeah. birthday party mm. like 150 children or something yeah, from the high society at, yeah. parents were at the table eating and drinking and the children were playing and this this being when this character really has lost every semblance of control and just running with this crowd and they attack this they do an insidious attack on this party and really sedate all the grown-ups and then they attack and kill almost all the children in front of them yeah. this and the parents weren't asleep they were seeing paralyzed they were paralyzed paralyzed great so before their eyes they were like cutting throats very very terrible scene and this is of course this is run by because there was a lot of infiltrators you could call it from a the pure bloods yeah anti lr yeah it's a hardcore racist faction Mm. Um, and they just they saw their chance to just ignite a racial war Yeah, yeah This is also the because if you had a lot of players here and they acted and they some of them got to see it, some of them realized how tricked they've been, some of them were active, and they also had one of the key NPCs. Children were hurt here, and he's a chemist, biologist, magician, and he vows to take a revenge. And this is actually the start of the. Because he's the creator of the Melding Plague, which kind of created all those monsters that we just referred to. Yeah. We can't really go into this, but this we'll, was... we will definitely have another <laughs> pod talking that, about that. That was a huge, huge thing for me as well, just because I was so organic. Yeah, I hadn't scripted this on because no. I wasn't sure what Daniel was gonna do when no. he came there, but he just took this to the insane lengths that mm. I was just. No, oh, he just got horrendous consequences back so yeah. it was a very memorable uh, mm. session and it was uh, six seven years ago maybe. Yeah. and it's still like it's very fresh in my mind uh, one of those moments where you just go this is uh this is role playing on a different level and if i just want to top that with the third thing just really short that's more like an a recent two recent small examples is just to say more like how the intricacies of the setting and how we were because we're growing older yeah because yeah. we had two adventures now centering uh, on or at least p- 
pivotal things in the adventures yeah. have been. And the first adventure was um, one of our characters hadn't really paid her taxes. So, yeah, we, so we went okay. to, the, uh, the, to the, the accountant, <laughs> the official family accountant. Yeah, so it, it, uh, it was a revision. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had to present the, um, what, what do you call them, the uh, receipts yeah. of our and, purchases. <laughs> and this was a, a thrilling adventure. For real, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not being ironic here. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was it was uh, be, very uh, scary <laughs> as a, as a player. I was like, did I how did I what, what did I buy? Oh, I have marmalade, right? Marmalade for how much? <laughs> so it's um, when you can really get that <laughs> judicial uh, economic side of the yeah. thrillers. So. Mm. Because we were the well, board of a group, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so we had to present the, uh, the our finances. Mm. Mm. But yeah, um, we are way over time, and we are probably going to have another podcast about Varangay. I, if, if I, I told you, 30 minutes isn't much. This is like the only time we've been this far over. Really? Uh, <laughs> but I hope, Toby, that you found this interesting. Yes. Because uh, uh, it sounds like, like an amazing world that's been built for many, many years. Yeah. And I hope one day maybe Toby can join and play. That would be cool. We'll yeah. see about my time. <laughs> yeah. We're all grown ups now, unfortunately, and our time is not unlimited. But thank you very much, Martin, for coming here and presenting your very, very uh, fleshed out uh, setting. And uh, I hope you guys who listened found this interesting. There will be more about this world. And just thank you, uh, Chris and Toby, just that you allowed me to just ramble on. No, <laughs> it is absolutely it fine. It, it was <laughs> really interesting to listen. You have an amazing way with your storytelling, Martin. And I think Varanga is going to be um, a setting we will return to again and again and again in one form or another, uh, I hope, at least. <laughs> and um, with that, we're going to end the episode. A very um, solemn mood, I'd say. But until next time, keep rolling. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Thank you for listening to Sweet Rolls. Your support means the world to us. The music you heard playing at the start and the end of this episode is Fireside Tales by Darren Curtis. The intent of this podcast is to discuss themes and issues in all manner of gaming, but primarily focused on the RPG genre. If you have any comments or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Pay us a visit at SweetRolls.com, where you can also learn about the people doing this podcast and more. For our Let's Play channel, check us out at youtube.com slash swede underscore fighters. And until next time, keep rolling. <laughs>